happy enough to uh, share some of my research and the work that I've been doing on cities, especially in relation to questions, uh, some of the critical questions, or at least some of the questions that really concern me and have concerned me for a long time of how we live together in cities and what media and communication has to do with any of this, living together and managing our um, fate in uh, urban spaces. So inevitably, uh, and at the time that I'm asked to give this presentation, it could not be but about Brexit. Um, and in many ways, this is my thought and my post-Brexit blues and how they are translated into academic conversation. So I'm reflecting, um, um, re reflecting here in, on uh, post-London Brexit, uh, post-Brexit London, uh, in a way it's also post-London, uh, post-Brexit uh, post London, and I want to share with you some thoughts around a, a particular project that, a project that I've been working on, which I think also relates to us asking bigger questions, especially bigger <coughs> questions about the ethics and politics of cosmopolitanism in an urban world. So, um, I'm thinking about Brexit and I'm thinking about the Brexit vote that left many Londoners in shock. As you might know, the city of London voted overwhelmingly against the vote, which ended up, of course, winning that of leaving the European Union. Uh, since the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of the vote, and still uh, in the city's material and digital streets, narratives of urban cosmopolitanism became mobilized by different Londoners in response to the referendum results. And this has been the case because for many, Brexit constitutes a direct attack to the city, but also to their individual values, beliefs, and way of life, as many uh, uh, urban dwellers have seen that. And I'm focusing here to a campaign called London is Open, and uh, uh, this is a campaign that has been initiated by the London mayor, uh, Sadiq Khan, and which I think is important to have as a, a critical starting point because it represents a powerful example of the city's response to vote. But it also, and for me importantly, and, uh, uh, conceptually and critically, it is a good uh, case study to reflect on urban cosmopolitanism, ethical complexities, but also contradictions. So my talk focuses on the mediation of London is Open campaign, and more specifically, I would like to introduce to you this uh, widely circulated film associated with the campaign on social media. I then want to turn to the responses to this call to openness and to cosmopolitanism among Londoners, among Londoners online and offline. At the core of my talk is the concept of the open city, and I'm trying to understand why that concept, open city, as a concept and as an ideal, is embraced by the government of the global city, but also by the people of the global city during times of crisis, to reflect on a shared urban imaginary. Yet, and while openness appears as a starting and fundamental point of identification at all different layers of the city, their ethical orientation, the ethical orientation of the urban dwellers uh, varies and actually diverges. And more significantly, it diverges in the way that um, uh, people's uh, individual and collective imaginaries po point to competing frames of cosmopolitanism that they embrace, what on the one hand I refer to as neoliberal cosmopolitanism, which we could say that this is the post-liberal articulation of openness and worldliness, and on the other hand, vernacular cosmopolitanism, the more messy, lived, and ordinary articulation of those same values of openness and worldliness. I will try to explain what I mean in the next few minutes. So as I argue, privileged urbanites, in this case in London, but I argue that privileged urbanites, people like us uh, uh, sitting in this room as well, for uh, privileged urbanites, openness and hospitality reflects a stance a habitus and an identity. Whilst for others, especially for those who are experiencing urban inequalities, these same ideals represent a claim and a politics of solidarity. My talk is organized in three parts. I first want to introduce how I think about urban cosmopolitanism 
uh, focusing on the concept of open city, the ethics of hospitality and their mediation. Uh, the second part I, I want to use to introduce the context of the empirical uh, study and the context of uh, post-Brexit -La uh, London and the London Social Campaign. And the third part concentrates on the specific field of the campaign I want to introduce and play to you, and also, most importantly, the responses online and offline to this campaign. So the empirical discussion, as I will try to show, analyzes the points where London's cosmopolitan ethical orientations converge and diverge, and I want to then conclude and reflect on what is the significance of this conversion, or especially the diversion of cosmopolitan imaginaries in relation to thinking of the mediation of cosmopolitan ethics. So, um, as I mentioned already, uh, the digital and material streets of the global city became sites where Londoners lamented the loss or the threat of loss of their cosmopolitanism. But also, uh, next to those vernacular spaces, next to those lived spaces, different campaigns took place um, at, across the city. London's official response to the Brexit vote has been driven by the language of the open city. I argue that this emphasis on openness is very important, not least as it speaks to popular and scholarly articulations of cosmopolitan imagination and visions for democratic and inclusive cities. Senate is one of the few people who actually gives us a more systematic definition of that concept of the open city, and he argues that the open city is a site of assemblages, mutual exchanges, and ambiguous edges. This is a city that contests, he says, neoliberalism closed systems, which, as he argues, aim to integrate control and order. And as he goes on to say, the open city is a bottom-up place. It belongs to the people. In popular culture, and some of you might have come across to that uh, piece of work, urban openness is most influentially discussed in the novel Open City of 2011 by Teju Cole. The novel has attracted scholarly attention precisely because it offers a rich, uh, very thoughtful and complex uh, articulation of urban openness. The novel Open City is inspiring also for me as it represents a literary tool to consider bigger conceptual questions, not least the double meaning of the city's openness, being both a sanctuary and a sociocultural space left to its own fate. The latter argument about the city, the open city being left to its own fate, is tied uh, to one of the ways that the open city has been conceptualized as a military term. In such a context, an open city refers to a condition where a belligerent nation facing possible attack may declare the target an open city. That means that the city will be unarmed and will not be defended. Theoretically, that designation should mean that the city will not be attacked. Thus, in this context, the open city is a surrounded city. Rather differently, of course, in social sciences, articulations of the open city lend the concept to cosmopolitanism and inclusive urbanism, a positive and promising, even if complex, affair. So even if opposition on the two conceptualizations, that of the uh, urban studies, uh, social uh, studies on the one hand and military terms on the other, these two conceptualizations converge in one idea. The open city is a potential sanctuary for citizens and a home for the vulnerable. Central to that claim are the conditions and demands for a city that is open to different voices, a site for a representational ethics where all can speak and be heard, as Silverstone argues, when uh, he introduces us to the ethics of media, so, uh, media hospitality. So the city, it, the open city, is a city that embraces ethics of hospitality. And in this context, it's not a coincidence that Derrida uses the city to locate his articulation of the ethics of hospitality. Derrida identifies the possibility of hospitality and recognition of difference as the experience and experimentation that is tied to the life of the city. So Derrida effectively, Derrida effectively argues that we should think through the city and beyond the nation of an ethics of hospitality. 
And in Derrida's cosmopolitan ethics, not unlike Sennett's collective vision of an open city, mutuality of engagement between those arriving and those receiving depends on shared experience. Yet Derrida, among many other uh, uh, proponents of cosmopolitan ethics, assumes a rather clear boundary between those receiving and those arriving. In his analysis, alterity remains external to the city. Alterity comes with the newcomers, those outsiders and strangers. <coughs> so he refers to cost and guest along the lines of cosmopolitan scholarship and hospitality that has been critiqued in different domains for reproducing a hierarchical order between us and them. Whether one subscribes to this critic or not, Derrida's city of refuge still ignores the fact that those who were once guests are now potential <coughs> hosts. The city's own settled migrants and diasporas. Thus, the city of host and guest carries an internal contradiction. It ignores city's internal heterogeneity and alterity, even though it is conceptualized as a city of refuge, precisely on the, on the base of its long history of being open and being a migrant destination. So, in response to these scholarly contradictions, but also challenges here, I raise three questions. Do we need to revisit the meaning of cosmopolitan openness and ethics of hospitality in a city that is largely constituted by old and new newcomers? So cities that do not necessarily only include a long-established internal population and new arrivals for migrants, but they are cities that have a long history of coexistence, as most of our cities are at present. Does the global city, which is a city of migrants and diasporas, and of rich and poor, call for a conceptualization of cosmopolitan ethics that acknowledges plurality of experience and of ethics? And do we need to more systematically study experience and the intersectional grid of power relations that shape cosmopolitan ethics? Anthropological and ethnographic approaches to cosmopolitanism, of course, have for long reminded us that um, city, city dwellers practice urbanity differently. For the transnational elites who congregate in the city, diversity is primarily experienced through consumption and in regular uh, encounters with other members of transnational elites. Consequently, experience builds skill to manage and develop competences, a cosmopolitan habitus and a taste, a cosmopolitan identity. In a much critiqued yet influential definition of cosmopolitanism, Harnett argues that it is Um, Hammers argues that it is an orientation, a willingness to engage with the other, an intellectual and aesthetic stance towards uh, divergent cultural experiences, a search for contrast rather than uniformity. As a privileged cosmopolitanism that Hammers describes depends on a consumption driven aesthetics, it raises questions about its ethical trajectories. Arguably, the moral drive of liberal cosmopolitanism that Hanners initially wrote about, which is associated with the Kantian uh, origins of the concept of cosmopolitanism itself, is thereby in crisis at that very moment that it is framed as an aesthetic and intellectual stance. Instead, the rising prominence and values of cultural uniqueness associated with a certain lifestyle and stance point to a transformed cosmopolitanism, perhaps what I'm trying to argue here, because what is the post-liberal version of cosmopolitanism, what we might refer to as neoliberal cosmopolitanism. In the context of neoliberal cosmopolitanism, liberal values such as those of equality, recognition and openness become subject to, or rather subordinate, to taste and aesthetics, lifestyle and consumption. Against that elite experience at the, whole, uh, at the core of Hannard's analysis and other liberal uh, uh, analysis of cosmopolitanism, Nina Werbner describes what she calls vernacular cosmopolitanism. 
Verb nerd locates cosmopolitan subjectivities in symbolic and material spaces, which are, as she says, transethnic, collectively emergent worlds, shared discourses that transcend cultural boundaries and parochial lifestyles. Cosmopolitan subjectivities here contribute to transethnic, cultural, and ideological worlds, as she adds. And along these same lines, Stuart Cole, among others, identifies also vernacular cosmopolitanism or working class cosmopolitanism or, uh, or uh, cosmopolitanism from below, as some of these uh, concepts have emerged interchangeably, as not being about choice, but being about survival, especially for migrants and diasporas. So if cosmopolitanism in the city reflects the diversity of its dwellers' experience, then its ethical orientations cannot be singular. This is where analyses such as those of Derrida's and Senate's fall short. Openness is about possibilities of being hospitable and having democratic and inclusive cities. But who speaks and who benefits from hospitality and from the vision of a cosmopolitan city? What and who is represented in the open city, and what modalities of openness and hospitality do representation of co representations of cosmopolitanism promote? Silverstone starts answering these questions by calling for a representational ethics of the Mediapolis, where difference is seen and also heard. It is the continued co-presence of multiple voices that defines both actually and potentially the possibility of mutual hospitality in the Mediapolis. Of course, hospitality begins in the recognition of the other and in the sound of his or her voice. It is the hospitality of a cosmopolitan society and of an intensively mediated culture. It involves sharing that space and taking responsibility for it and it involves all parties accepting the obligation to open their space to the stranger, irrespective of their position in the media hierarchy. Silverstone's representational ethics is reflected in media hospitality, or rather on the demand, as he says, of for media hospitality, as the extension of responsibility to seeing and hearing others in the media. So if we think about the London campaign, is a media campaign for and on behalf of the city that puts forward an ethics of hospitality and which adopts a language of cosmopolitan openness, an example of such representational ethics as that which Silverstone proposes? Does the ethic of hospitality of London is open expand the space for hearing and seeing diverse Londoners and diverse, a diverse city? Which cosmopolitan experience and ethics are privileged and which are silenced. As I will show in the discussion of the campaign, what London is Open puts forward is an ethic uh, of urban openness and hospitality against ethno ethnocentric parochialism. A powerful message within the national context, it does little yet to represent urban cosmopolitanism in its complexity as I will try to show indeed with reference to the responses it attracts, the mediated message of urban cosmopolitanism marginalizes the very politics that makes it possible. So in the next few minutes I will introduce this campaign, London is Open, and I will focus on the short film, London is the City of Film. This film was launched in October 2016 and posted on YouTube, but also the mayor's Facebook page. This is the most widely viewed and circulated campaign film across social media, with almost half a million views on the mayor's Facebook page, and almost 5,000 shares on the same page, so far. Given that this is an official campaign, and in an official campaign production, that these levels of viewing and sharing, I think, are remarkable. As I will try to show, the attractiveness and emotional appeal of the film was also evident in the numerous comments, both on the mayor's Facebook page and on the many likely, even if contradictory, responses among participants in the focus groups I conducted with young Londoners. 
The discussion uh, and the findings and the empirical analysis I will present draw from discourse analysis of the film, London is the city of film, and the thematic uh, analysis of the responses to it, as these are recorded on the mayor's Facebook page and also in three focus groups I conducted with young people aged between 17 and 22. One of the groups is constituted by middle class uh, university candidates. The second group, primarily by working class, uh, ethnically mixed, uh, uh, it is an ethnically mixed group. And the third group is a minority, ethnic minority group, consisting by a levy Turkish and Kurdish uh, young people. <coughs> As the discussion examined wider themes of urban uh, life and belonging in these focus groups, the comments on the film were analyzed in the context of the broader uh, reflections of participants on living in the global city. And in addition to the focus groups, I analyzed 317 comments on the mayor's Facebook page, and I'm referring to some of them, of course, after uh, uh, seeking and getting permission by those participants. The campaign London is Open was launched only a month after the referendum of last June, but continued, <coughs> continued and is still continuing. The campaign unfolds in three, main in three main media domains. The official campaign website that you can see here, a series of six short films under the umbrella heading London is Open, hashtag London is Open, circulated across social media, and in the mainstream media coverage. Of the campaign. It is important for me to note the distinctions between narrations of openness in the three different media domains. As you can see there, the official media, uh, uh, the official campaign website focuses on, La on London as a financial powerhouse, visibly targeting audiences from within the global corporate and financial sectors. The website is simple and it lacks interactivity, but has a number of props that link the message of openness and diversity with investment opportunities, not least through the neoliberal language of open markets. As highlighted there on the page, but you cannot read, but so I will read it for you. London is open for business. We're an outward looking city with one of the most open and dynamic economies in the world. Many international businesses and entrepreneurs have chosen to make London their home and we look forward to welcoming more in the future. So in this case, the city that is open is a market that is open. in its design and narratives. The six short films, and you can see here a screenshot from some of them, around which the social media campaign develops, are titled London opens its doors to the world, our message to the rest of the world, sports stars join mayors had Sadiq Khan to spread the message, London is the city of film, London is the city of dance, and London is the city of shopping. Each film is under a minute long, the first three films, which were produced earlier in the campaign, represent direct ethical responses to Brexit through visual and discursive narrations of weakness, tolerance and openness. Most directly, the message of hospitality is core to the film London opens its door to the world, with a series of images of opening doors into London's shops and homes, and with the mayor opening his doors at the end of the film and inviting the viewer in. The three last film's narratives are more clearly structured as city branding exercises, unlike the first ones which were moral calls to openness. Framing openness around three distinct cultural industries, film, dance and fashion. As the campaign matures, and as uh, shown in the last three films, the emphasis shifts from being about putting the city's voice forward to commodifying openness and incorporating it in a vision of post-Brexit London, where cultural industries still thrive. At the same time, and in their differences, what the films share is the adoption of images and discourses associated with vernacular cosmopolitanism and their adaptation to a framework of aesthetic cosmopolitanism. 
the film's aesthetics, put Londoners at the core of the narration of openness. The common theme is that London speaks. But of course, the London that speaks and the Londoners that speak are very carefully selected individuals. The third message in all films beyond their differences is clear. Protect our city, celebrate diversity, and keep the city open. But open to whom? Alongside, alongside social media and mainstream media, the campaign appears as merging the official websites and the social media tactics. Uh, their uh, narratives and aesthetics come all together in the way that the campaign is covered in mainstream media. Mainstream media, many of them uh, appear very sympathetic to the campaign with the London's uh, daily living standard being in the forefront, uh, forefront of coverage uh, and of positive coverage, give voice to the same Londoners that represent the campaign. And very often, as you can see there again, they give often voice to the mayor of the city, to the official face of the hashtag London is open. The multiple dimensions of the campaign's media strategy show that the concept of the open city is mobilized to draw a complex vision of cosmopolitanism that is relevant to businesses as well as to citizens and to consumers within the city and around the world. Most prominently, and as Tom has demonstrated in social media's emphasis on a humanistic, culture-centric and people-centric narration of urban cosmopolitanism, the open city speaks directly to an ethics of hospitality. An ethics of hospitality is mobilized at times of crisis and when the global city feels under pressure to close its gates to outside. Thus, and in this way, London is open, adapts visual and discursive narratives of hospitality to emphasize that the city welcomes everyone. In the films, the opening doors of London's homes and shops and in the parades of different individuals and cultures on screen, this message is projected repeatedly, clearly and firmly. If these narratives are indeed promoting though an ethics of hospitality, a politics of uh, uh, cosmopolitan solidarity could be assumed to be the underlying thing. Yet this politics, it is the politics of solidarity that is subdued if not fully marginalized in the campaign. More particularly, cosmopolitan openness is about hospitality, but it's also a campaign for open markets, as we see. The open city does not only fit into a liberal vision of the city, but also it taps and expands London's aggressive neoliberal orientation, as expressed, of course, beyond this campaign, and in recent years, local and national policies of austerity and de de deregulation of markets. London is open for business, as we saw, is one of the core messages of hashtag London is open, mm -hmm. especially on its official website and in mainstream media communication. London has for long built its economic power upon layers of established symbolic power. <coughs> Thus, the emphasis on cultural narratives of openness does not contradict the economic-centered one. On the contrary, the story of London as an open city for people and corporations is persuasively, precisely because it has always been a story of the rich and productive encounters and mobilities upon which the city's symbolic power has been built, as I discuss um, in more detail in my book, Media and the City, to shame me to some self-promotion. <laughs> But let me now move to the specific uh, film, London is the City of Film, that I introduced, which I want to further analyze in its representations and to, in its responses, in the responses it analyzed. Um, Annalina, I lost the screen there, so I don't know how to make this. So this has gone. Commercial Everyone is different, so anyone may be different. 
I like the spirit of this great wonder which I feel around me. It is a roost for every bird. Because it's not the walls that make the city, but the people who live in it. And the London Underground is not a political movement. I looked it up. And I will take you to foggy London town, because you are my little gentleman. There's things half in shadow, and halfway in light, and we've got to London. Phew, what a sight. When a man or woman is tired of London, then they are tired of London. <laughs> so this is the film that uh, intrigued on the first place my interest um, in this project. And more than the film itself, of course, it was the many passionate uh, responses to it on Facebook um, that then um, uh, uh, made me interested in investigating a bit more about how different languages respond to this message and to the call to arms of, for the cosmopolitan city. So as you can see, this film represents a seamless collage of the voices and faces of 12 famous actors, directors and the mayor of the city himself. As you can see, the film's narrative taps into emotional and ethical concerns surrounding the risks of London not being open, hospitable and diverse after Brexit. Indeed, the film represents an impassioned celebration of London's cosmopolitanism, as this is voiced by a carefully selected group of individuals. Visually, and in the face of each of those speakers, in the film we can see or we can imagine the long history of migration hospitality and conviviality. And this all merged in communicating an uninterrupted and cosmopolitan message. The visuality of the film aims to capture London's aesthetic and live diversity in a warm, welcoming, humorous and unthreatening manner. Importantly, as you might have noticed, the film is in black and white, perhaps in an attempt to look more cinematic than factual, but also reflecting perhaps a nostalgic glance into London. A selective representation of a city that most of us will recognize and many of us will desire. There is no doubt that the collage of represented ethnic and gender diversity is very carefully collated in this film, even orchestrated, to project not just a message of unity, but a message of unity in difference. These cinematic representations of diversity can be read as a call to an ethics of hospitality, where, as noted in the film, everyone is welcome. The, global, uh, the globally recognized and clear pronunciation of all speakers, as well, also is complemented by subtitles, if you have noticed in the film, reaffirm the commodification of the cosmopolitanism that is accessible and consumable across global spaces and among global audiences. Thus, we could even argue that in the film, ethnic difference becomes the spectacle. Yet the values that surround the recognition of ethnic difference and commodified and stripped from the transformative politics of the street, as Keith would argue, nourish the utopian romance in the eroticized imaginary of the diverse city, rather perhaps the complexities of the diverse city. So to sum up in this brief introduction of the film, the, this film, London is the City of Film, mobilizes aesthetic and moral props associated with, with what I call neoliberal cosmopolitanism. It is visionary, it is sensible, <coughs> and it's also firm in London being a welcoming, inclusive, global city. But at the same time, of course, it is selective and hierarchical in terms of who speaks, how they speak, and on behalf of whom and in what kind of a voice. Its narrations of diversity and of the cosmopolitan ethics assumes that both speakers and audiences are individual agents, individual rather than groups. They represent themselves more than anybody else. Individual agents who equally enjoy cosmopolitan values and lifestyles. Yet the range of experiences outside this imaginary are fully silenced. 
So in my study, I was intrigued by these narratives of uh, urban cosmopolitanism and delved into finding out what responses they generated. Online and offline responses to the film were emotional as a role and overwhelmingly, both on the social media domains and on, in folk script discussions. Converging in terms of values, the values of openness, hospitality, and diversity, responses also diverged in their interpretation of what these values mean and on who they speak for and who they speak to. So I want to share now with you some of those responses, which I present under to the two main things, uh, the two main conceptual things that I'm thinking about and through that of neoliberal cosmopolitanism and that of vernacular cosmopolitanism. And hopefully, um, the meaning of these concepts will become clearer uh, through the period of material as well. So the overarching uh, cosmopolitan narrative of the film captures the imagination of many on social media and in the focus groups. There is almost a, a universal agreement with the representation of London as a cosmopolitan diverse city. For example, among the 317 meta responses on the Facebook uh, page, on the Baker's Facebook page, only 12 comments uh, challenged the fact that London is cosmopolitan, is diverse, and so on. So, so this agreement is almost taken for granted. A cosmopolitan position that represents the starting rather than the end point of urban imaginaries. So now, we're all cosmopolitan. Yeah, we're all cosmopolitans. What I'm trying to understand, how are we cosmopolitans and why it doesn't matter that we're not all cosmopolitans in the same way. The appeal of the line in the film, London is a roast for every bird, that you might remember, uh, being spoken there by um, uh, director um, uh, Chata, uh, there is evidence of the convergence of urban and cosmopolitan imaginaries. This, importantly and interestingly, London is a roost for every bird, is, uh, is the phrase that is most commented upon on Facebook, presenting vivid evidence that an ethics of hospitality is at the heart of Londoners and global audiences' understanding of cosmopolitan openness. So you can see some of these comments here on the slide behind me. For those embracing the film's neoliberal cosmopolitanism, Two sub themes appear as important identification, a way that they see themselves through the concept of identity, and aesthetics, which links, of course, to practices and ideologies associated with consumption and consumers. Numerous respondents on Facebook and most of the middle class students' focus group participants commented on how they could identify with the film's characters and narratives. Shows how diverse our city is. It makes me proud to be a Londoner where phrases repeated, uh, repeatedly expressed both in the focus groups and on the Facebook site. When, when I asked uh, who the target audience of the film is, focus group participants pointed to themselves, and one said, the good young audience. And another said, I'd say where they once were 100% implying sharing the values of the film. A young female participant explained further why she could identify with herself as being targeted and represented in this film because of what the actors are wearing. The cosmopolitan middle class representations of individuals within the context of celebrity were also warmly, warmly welcomed by middle class participants and a number of respondents on Facebook. For those Londoners who have relatively privileged access to the city's material and symbolic resources, Diversity, hospitality, celebrity, and consumerism represent elements of life, ordinary life in the cosmopolitan city. For them, the selected representations in the film construct an urban reality that they experience, or at least that they aspire and they feel that they could experience. This is also evident in the middle class participants' engagement with the film's aesthetics and positive message. They could all identify and recognize the nicer areas of London in the film. They all agree that it is normal and expected to show the nice side of London in the film. Asked if anything is missing from these representations, a male participant said, you're not going to make it a horrible video, are you? 
<laughs> Showing awareness, of course, that London is not only represented in the film, but it is also sold to audiences. This awareness of the branded city is confirmed in numerous comments on Facebook. Some are comments by London visitors and tourists who embrace the film because, as they many uh, say, it represents the city that they love to see, to, to, and they love to visit, to shop and enjoy. Another male participant in the middle class focus group told me that uh, he was too absorbed by the film, uh, film's aesthetic cosmopolitanism. So when I asked him what he thought about the video's content, he said, I'm not sure, I was too busy trying to recognize all the celebrities. <laughs> so I didn't pay much attention to what they said. <laughs> what becomes evident is that the cosmopolitan values prominent in the film, diversity, openness, hospitality, represent a starting point for many privileged Londoners and London visitors to identify with the film. While these values appear as fundamental to identifying themselves, they also ask, uh, act as a springboard for self-making. Aesthetic cosmopolitanism links the cosmopolitan values represented in the film to their own, as individuals who freely move and consume in the diverse city and in an interconnected world, privileged respondents identify with openness as a quality, but also as a stance associated with their own individual freedoms and identity. London is an open, of course, but it's also an unequal city. Neoliberal cosmopolitanism, as reflected in the film, London is the City of Film, focuses on the city's openness and ethics of hospitality, but at the same time, it sidelines inequalities by ignoring diversities, very different biographies and histories. Responses coming primarily from those who experience the city as an, as an unequal and hierarchical system embrace the campaign's ethics of hospitality. And this is very important that people who were a bit more distant from the field still embrace its ethics of hospitality, but it reje they rejected its neoliberal articulation. More strikingly, a different ethics of hospitality was revealed in a number of vernacular cosmopolitan responses of fa on Facebook. So, as you will see there, many of those responses are, more, uh, are less about vision, unlike the liberal or neoliberal orientation of more privileged people, and they are more about politics, or at least the need for a politics of solidarity and care. Within the main theme of vernacular cosmopolitanism, two prominent sub-themes can be identified in the online and offline responses, inequality and collective values, which I oppose to the prominent sub-themes of identity and consumption in the case of neoliberal cosmopolitanism. Speaking through and about experiences of inequality, some respondents adopt a reflexive dialogue with the film's articulation of hospitality, while welcoming it, they also critique its politics for enhancing privilege and marginalizing difference. One of the film's lines, which you might remember, when a man or a woman is tired of London, then they are tired of life, generated passionate responses on Facebook. And you can see uh, some of those responses. I used to think when I was tired of London, I'd be tired of life. Now I'm just tired. As a single working mother, not on benefits, almost all of my income goes to rent and childcare and all of my time working or commuting. The city is becoming less and less for the average family and certainly not for the average single parent. A very different response, which does not reject the message, but translates it in a very different way to the responses we saw before. Similarly, the next one, which uh, the language is a bit strange here, but I think you get the message. Uh, Mr. Sadiq Khan talking to the mayor. Uh, uh, I need your attention. Yesterday it happened a very awful incident with a woman who was wearing the hijab. Someone tried to remove from her head in your city, London. Kindly make freedom well known to everyone, especially for women. So these responses represent a painful realization of the contradictory and the contradictions rather than opposition to the ethics of hospitality. 
The co cosmopolitan values of the field and of the city's leadership are shared by those participants, as I mentioned, almost universally among those more critical and less privileged participants. Yet importantly, those who speak at the one school also need those values, not in order to construct an identity, but in order to find a place in the city which they see as increasingly less welcoming and less open to social and cultural difference. In this painful realization of inequality and discrimination, there is also a projection of collective values vis-à-vis -vis the individual project that neoliberal cosmopolitans promotes. The call to the menu, for example, that we see here to protect Muslim women is a call for hospitality for those who are not like us, but who need, who are indeed part of the city. These are the people who in Derrida and Silverstone's hospitality seek refuge. Yes, yet these are the same people who in the city still depend on the ethics of hospitality, even though they are themselves Londoners. The complex requirements of an ethics of hospitality are also captured in working class and ethnic minority participants and in their works. Among them, a cosmopolitan commitment remains prominent. As a male participant in the Alevi focus group said in explaining what he saw as the main message of the film, he says, London's, uh, uh, London's a multicultural city open to anyone. You'll fit in, there's opportunity. And a field male participant in the same group added in reaffirming a commitment to the cosmopolitan city, it's the best thing there is. It's very moving political message out there. Yet her identification with the cosmopolitan city is also political. You know, showing the world that London is a very, very nice place, but that's all uh, the film is saying. There are so many problems that people, citizens, that citizens themselves see. Go out in the street at night and you'll see tons of people who are homeless. For working class and ethnic minority participants, the props of aesthetic cosmopolitanism are not only unattractive, but as a matter of fact, they are alienating. In a response that projects the need for solidarity against celebrity, an Alevi male participant says, the mayor is trying to bring a lot of celebrities in because the celebrity culture is big, obviously. So he tries to pass on a message through celebrities, but for me, it just the celebrity influence is nothing to me. Who knows? London is open, central London is open, but everywhere else, people are dying of poverty. Similar sentiments are expressed by the young working class focus group participants. The selected people in the film are diverse, but upmarket, as one says. Identifying a commodified difference projected in neoliberal cosmopolitanism, which is distant to her. Along her criticism, two others wonder where the Muslim Londoners or the Polish Londoners are. Absent, they noted. For some, the critic of aesthetic cosmopolitanism is a critic of neoliberalism. A young woman in the working class group became frustrated with the representations of London's diversity and the staged ordinariness that excludes real people's experiences. As uh, almost a proper social scientist, she goes on to say, go a bit deeper than just black, white, Asian, or whatever. Get more in there. And others use this campaign as a point of reflection on the contradictions of the values and realities that surround them, especially racism, poverty, and inequality. One of the male participants in the same focus groups uh, picked up these contradictions to emphasize that London, the city in which he was born and where he is bred, is not hospitable to him. In a painful and very uh, upsetting comment to me, he says, living in London is extortionary. So like, I'm guessing they only need a certain type of pe person or people in London in the next, let's say, 10 or 15 years and I might not be even here myself. So I don't know if I'm really a Londoner or not. I don't really know the rules. This response is a painful realization that the openness of the city does not extend to those who need it. As media hospitality applies selectively to certain voices and certain experiences, some participants felt more alienated from the open city and its representations. To him, a Londoner, Hospitality is being denied. 
At times of crisis, for many, the most fundamental values associated with cosmopolitan ethics become reduced to a set of aesthetic but alienating media representations. Yet, and against the selective extension of media hospitality, those experiencing urban inequalities articulate the politics of dissent through references to what the city ought to be. I guess the similarly sounding Against the similarly sounding voices of the film's protagonist, a male respondent on Facebook speaks for the voices and experiences of marginality that are missing. Who are the copies, the old school standards, the Bermondsey and Brixton sounding voice, basically making reference to the long standing and established working class uh, uh, people of London? I see actors, I don't see London. Some comments like those can be read as a claim to the city as the fair proposes, and as uh, Harvey takes uh, further, the right to the city directly challenges urban inequalities as it emphasizes that all beyond class, ethnicity, and gender have the right to participate in shaping the city and enjoy its material and its symbolic resources. Such dissent from the film's representational narrative is not only political, but it also points to another kind of cosmopolitan politics. A politics that needs and depends on solidarity and on inclusive participation. So what ethics and who is hospitality for them? This case, I think, and in my eyes, demonstrates that more often than not, the global city presents us with a cosmopolitanist divided ethical frames, rather than presenting us with divides between parochialism and cosmopolitanism. The city's long history of migration and its diverse uh, sociocultural assemblages have advanced openness and hospitality. These values are widely shared, though they remain conditional. Not unlike its military definition, the open city remains unprotected and fragile for many. Not least when it comes to the ethical predicaments tied to the internal diversity and inequalities of the city. So as shown, uh, and uh, as I come uh, to my conclusions, uh, what I argue is that neoliberal cosmopolitanism, the post-liberal uh, articulation of cosmopolitanism as we often uh, know it, appears as neoliberal cosmopolitanism that works with familiar and well-established narratives of aesthetic cosmopolitanism. These are visible in the celebratory narratives of openness, where values of diversity and world interconnectedness go hand in hand with urban worldliness and economic prosperity. Neoliberal cosmopolitanism reflects an identity project tied to habitus and cosmopolitan education. As an identity project, though, even though it draws from cosmopolitan ethics of openness and hospitality, as a project, it negates those very values when it comes to responsibility and collective sharing of the city's resources. For many middle-class urbanites or educated privileged urbanites like many of us, there is no other way to be, to think, and to consume but within a cosmopolitan frame. This way of life is reflexive and aware of difference in its complexities, of course. However, its ethics is limited to acknowledgement of diversity, but without commitment to it. It is an ethics of respect without recognition. As one of the young participants, as you remember, said, you are not going to make this a horrible video, are you? Showing that he's aware, like many of us, of them, the participants, uh, are aware of the open city as more than an aesthetically pleasing commodity. Yet, the least pleasing side of the city is the one that should remain hidden, should remain voiceless. So the invisibility of those who actually need hospitality is acceptable and legitimized within the media of neoliberal cosmopolitanism. In this way, neoliberal cosmopolitanism reproduces a moralistic vision that assumes a shared experience, which, however, is of course not in practice widely shared. This is a vision which is blind to inequalities. And what can we say about vernacular cosmopolitanism and its ethical orientation? 
Vernacular cosmopolitanism does not preclude the absence of habitus. However, its reflexive and is with the status quo reflects an orientation rather than a set of identities, which is shaped through experience and encounters of diversity and inequality in the global city. In the contemporary cosmopolitan, but an even city, vernacular cosmopolitanism cannot be content, proud, or happy. Rather, it appears as sober, injured, and changing, precisely as the world around it is changing. It appears as more aware of the intersectionality of discrimination that brings together experiences of ethnicity, race, gender, and class in the neoliberal city. So what I wanted to argue in this presentation is that what we can see in the study of the representations and the reflections of the cosmopolitan is the growing gap between the different cosmopolitans, cosmopolitanism that brings us together, but also divides us. <coughs> what hopefully I managed to do is to reflect and share with you some of the expressions of the major power struggles that take place within and not against cosmopolitanism. The ethics of hospitality that a vernacular cosmopolitanism incorporates it's fragile in its conviction. But precisely because of that, this is where I want to see a more, uh, a, a, a less uh, pessimistic, a less uh, a horrible picture for the future. But because this politics is fragile in its con conviction, it is closer to politics of solidarity. Solidarity for those who are increasingly marginalized on the city's material and digital streets. This is an ethics that is defined, offered, but also denied from the position of internal alterity, from the migrants, the refugees, and the urban poor, those whose lives have for long been defined through acts of solidarity or their denial. And this is an ethics that precisely because it speaks through the experience of inequality, it cannot but contest those representations of openness that negate justice in the media and beyond. Thank you.